You know, I've always loved astronomy. I got the telescope I had since I was a child. I remember tracking the motion of the stars to the horizon when I was six with my sister when she took a high school astronomy class. Uh, I've witnessed two comets. I even had a star past the base of the constellation Cygnus named after me. Yeah, I've studied black holes, tried to learn more about astrophysics, the whole nine yards. And I've noted that there are studies and possibly plans for NASA after setting up a space station. They may be planning a colony on the moon for inhabitants as a part of the test study, which would also entail the long-term effects of the change in gravitational force on the human body. And I heard this, that, that there may be plans for this living on the moon within the next 20 to 30 years. And I thought, my God, I am meant for this. I would be perfect for this. But then I thought, what would I do there? Why would they want me there? And I'm a journalist, I've written all my life, and I'm a designer, and my job would be to catalog what is going on at the colony and to distribute news to the colony about what is going on on the moon, and maybe also even about what is going on on Earth. And I like this plan. It would seem fitting, giving me occasional fees through occasional transmittals of information for me to pass on to the colony. And I would catalog historically what is happening here for people to learn from on Earth. Hey, this sounds like the perfect thing to me. And then I thought, wow. I would disseminate all information to this colony of people on the moon. <laughs> I would be their only link to the news. I could tell them anything. <laughs> I mean, just think about this for a moment. I could tell them anything, and they wouldn't be able to use another source to prove me wrong. I, I could, I, uh, I could tell them I sang the national anthem for the president. And no, really, I don't have that bad of a voice. But we, but we uh, sing for it because we're going to live on the moon. And I would tell these people on the moon, and these people would believe me. <laughs> I wonder if I'd have to write reports to send back to Earth. Would I have to tell them how hypnotic the effects of the Earth light are? Because, you know, people around here always talk about how beautiful and wonderful the moonlight is. Moonlight is a hypnotist putting people in a trance. Whenever you look at it, it takes over your soul. No one can stop it, but no one seems to want to. for a worthy adversary, someone I can lock horns with, because although my life makes more sense when I'm alone, it's not nearly as interesting. I've been looking for a worthy adversary, someone I get battled to the death with, because it can't be about love, you see. Love can't exist on the terms I demand. It's never that pure. I've been looking for a worthy adversary, and so I slither up to you like a snake and tempt you with a golden apple. But I'll always offer you as fruit from the tree of knowledge. I didn't know how willing you were, and I didn't know you'd have a thing or two to teach me, too. Because as I've been looking for a worthy adversary, all this time I've been playing a part an actress on a stage, spouting the lines on cue. And that role was getting tiresome, but those stage lights still came on, night after night, and I still had to play my part. 
until on my night off, I saw your performance at the theater down the street. And, and you know, your protagonist was doing what I was doing, right down to faking it with people who don't matter, right down to going home and still feeling empty. And you know, I'm beginning to wonder if maybe we could get together and write our own play. It would be a masterful performance, you know? And as that curtain would close, we'd hold each other's hands and walk off the stage, and the audience would know that there would be a happy ending. And now when I walk out onto the set, and there you stand in front, stage left, I wait for my cue to make my move. None of the rest of the scene matters to me, you know? Maybe they'd like our little play. Maybe they wouldn't. Who really cares? For now you tempt me and tease me and torment me and tell me everything I was too afraid to believe and show me the knowledge that has always escaped me. And you know, when you talk, you reach your hand into my brain and pull out my thoughts and shove them into your mouth and spit them back at me. And instead of filling me with terror, it fills me with joy. I've been looking for a worthy adversary and maybe you are so much more than that. Because now every day is Valentine's Day, and now it's like candy and flowers and springtime and hearts and cupids and sunshine, and you know it's scary. These cliches are actually beginning to make sense. Because now I wait for you to come on stage again for our next wonderful performance, where we have our happy ending, where you tell me what I already know. You know, my job, uh, I'm hated for being good at my work, and I'm hated for trying to make myself better. Uh, everyone has given up here, so I have to pick up the pieces after them. Uh, others scream because they don't like the answers that I give to the questions that they ask. They all just want me to do everything, and they want me to smile about it. <laughs> no one can finish a job here. No one cares to. And then everyone wonders why I'm not happy here. That everyone thinks I'm overreacting. With my coworkers, there's no sense of pride, or else there's an egoism coupled with a complete disregard for others. And I feel like I'll have to settle for the rest of my life. I hate the fact that people hate me when I'm right. Will I always have to settle, settle for idiots telling me what to do, settle for idiots hating me because I have pride, idiots settle for idiots loving me, idiots who don't even know what love is. I, I feel like I can't be an optimist forever when the odds are continually stacked against me. I, I have nothing but my mind to help me with this fight when everyone else is fighting me by shutting their minds off. How do I live in the middle of a barren desert? Well, remember, Janet, I get it straight. I keep telling this to yourself, and maybe eventually you'll believe it. Whenever you're at work, you're never right. You're overbearing, obnoxious, and you always think you're right. All you have to do is follow orders. No one wants you to use your mind. Just follow the winds of everyone who wants to rule you. Don't make waves. When they change their mind, don't ask why. Always take the blame, especially when it's not your fault. Uh, always thank people, uh, even if it's just, even, even if it's for something, doing something that they were supposed to do. <laughs> especially thank them for that, because who are you to think that people should know or do anything? Who are you to think? <laughs> We've been looking for a new employee. Uh, we've sifted through the resumes. We've interviewed a few. And some were good, 
some were very good. And so we took some time to decide, and then we called our number one choice. And they said they wanted more money than we offered. So we said our goodbyes, and we called our second choice. And they said they couldn't work at such a small place, so someone at work decided that maybe we should interview some more. And, and that's when I knew, at the rate that we were going, we'd never find anyone, and no one would want us. A co-worker quit from the company I work for today. I work in an office with about 35 people. And now this co-worker was in charge of our trade shows and quit two days before our annual trade show was about to begin. Apparently she was at a meeting about the trade show and someone else just started badgering her. And 20 minutes after the meeting, she was on the phone with her husband saying, it's been hard enough that every day after work I, I cry when I get home, but, but now I'm on the phone crying while I'm at work. And so her husband told her it's, it's okay if she wants to leave, they can work it out. So leave she did. She collected her things, said, fuck you all, I'm quitting, and just left. And now, I only got to hear about this scene secondhand. I didn't actually get to see her or even say goodbye to her. And, and you know, that's a real shame because I probably would have shook her hand and thanked her for doing something that just about every other person in our office is pretty much dreamt about doing on a daily basis. I mean, when I hear, heard about what she did, I let out this low, sadistic laugh. You know, one of those laughs that comes from really deep down. <laughs> because we haven't had one of those good, angry, quitting scenes in quite a while, and believe me, they're always fun to watch. And I laugh like that because I know what she was going through, and I know what a relief it must have been for her to do it. She's not the first person to do this to my boss, and I'm sure she won't be the last. At once, I, I saw a saleswoman walk right up to my boss in the hallway, get right up into his face, and tell him, you're an asshole. You have no idea how to run this business. You are incompetent, and so are your favorite employees. You make me sick. I quit. I've only been here four years, and I can tell I can't take it here much longer, but in these past four years, I've seen a turnover rate of like 40% or something, and the retraining alone is putting too much of a stress on the staff. I wanted you to know that I was on a mission when I saw you, and that I was a warrior, and that you were just a helpless victim that couldn't fight my weaponry, that wouldn't fight my weaponry. I would come into town and pillage and rape, and rape and pillage, depending on how you put it, and rape is such a hard, harsh word, you know, entirely inappropriate for this because I made sure that you wanted me when it was all over because I am now for doing that when I fight my battles. This is how I care to think of you. I was on a conquest and I came fully equipped with ammunition. I had bayonets, I had a rifle with rounds of bullets on a chain thrown over my shoulder. I had a 22 caliber magazine loaded handgun. I didn't even need to use the hand grenade or the tear gas. Even before I started using my tongue as a weapon with a kiss, I used it as a weapon with words, and I knew I had you won over from the start. You looked at me when I spoke, and I think you might have actually wanted to listen to me. And I would never have to resort to violence to get what I wanted from you. I know I wasn't ready for a battle before, but I came ready to fight. And I wanted you to know that. But, but no, it was not a momentous moment in my life. It was just a moment, a conquest, a battle. And in my own mind, I won the war. You 
thought I would always want you, and you know I liked winning the battle, but I'll have to work again now so that you don't come back to haunt me, because we weren't meant to be anything to each other, and you were just a conquest for me. A battle won. People thought we would never get along, but, but I know better. I know there is no such thing as not getting along with me. <laughs> and I know I can make anyone like me as I did with you. You are easy prey, you know. the city. I know, I know, I've been here for years, but I haven't gone to the Sears Tower Observatory since my junior prom. But when I walk by the first Chicago building, the beams along the north side, sloping up, parabolic pillars curving up to the sky. When I walk by that first Chicago building, I walk up along the side, and I lean against one of those sloping pillars, press my body against the cold concrete, feel the cold against my chin, my breasts, my thighs, and I look up along that curve, stretching up toward the sky. And you know, those pillars, they, they look like race cars, and I could just see something come rushing down that curve. A matchbox car, a race car, a marble, a bowling ball, a two-ton weight. I see the speed, the power, and it, and it almost makes me afraid to look up. I do the same thing every time I walk by the first Chicago building. I do the same thing. I do this little ritual. And it feels like the first time. Today is June 11th, exactly nine months after the September 11th crashes. It's strange that everyone thought about the fact that the terrorists decided to destroy greatness on 9-1-1. It's strange how close I came to losing friends and family. My friend didn't happen to go to work at the trade centers or at the Pentagon for business that week. Uh, my brother-in-law lost a slew of contacts who died in New York. The Pennsylvania plane landed about a mile from my sister-in-law's house. My friend in D.C., he wasn't hurt, but he talked about how different streets would be closed on different days and that there were so many military guards there you felt like you were in a war zone which, in a way, you were. And these terrorists, they had a masterful plan. They were stopped that day from starting different flights, and, and one of them was slated, I think, to run into the Sears Tower. I mean, I mean think about the emotional effects of these disasters. I know different people had different reactions, but, but I know that for months afterward, whenever we were driving toward the loop, taking the Kennedy where you could see the Chicago skyline get closer and closer. I know that every time we drove by, I would be sitting in the passenger seat and I would imagine seeing a plane fly right into the side of this year's tower, toward the top, to the side, exactly like how we saw it on the World Trade Centers, like how you saw it over and over again on television when we were flooded with images of it on the news. I'd see a plane flying into this tallest building, this landmark to Chicago. I still see that sometimes, whenever we're driving into the city, imagining witnessing the destruction, seeing it all, and thinking, what do you do then? 
be, what do you do when you get that feeling? It, it, have you ever had a feeling before, you know, the one where someone's telling you something that you don't want to hear? Like if someone was about to tell you that someone died and you, and you knew what they were going to say, you still didn't want to hear it? Or if someone did something to you that you didn't like, like when you were little and the kids at the bus stop shot pebbles and spitballs at you every day because you were smart and you still had to go to the bus stop and just try to ignore them? <laughs> Uh, and when that happens, it feels like a medium-sized rock just fell into the bottom of your stomach. And, and you don't want to move because you're afraid that that will hurt the inside of your stomach. And so you just have to sit there and hope that that rock will go away. Uh, or else you get that feeling in your chest, right between your lungs. It feels like someone's pressing on that bone there right there by your heart, and you've got to breathe. You're not, you're not going to be able to take that pressure, that force, any longer. I don't know how many times the idea of seeing him went through my mind. At least once a week, I'd imagine a scene where he'd confront me, and I'd somehow be able to fight him back to show him that he didn't bother me anymore, to, to show him that that rock wasn't there anymore to somehow be able to prove that I wasn't a victim anymore. I was a survivor. You see, that's what they call it now, you see, survivor, because victim sounds too trying for someone who's been raped. So, so I keep saying I'm over it, but I keep imagining him all over again, and not raping me, but, but coming to me on the street trying to buy me flowers or send me a valentine. But, but, but once, I saw him walking out of the record store as I was walking in, and that rock fell so hard that I thought I was going to be sick, right there by the cash register, right, right there by those metal things that are supposed to be when you try to take merchandise out of the store, you know what those things are called, I just can't think of what they're called off the top of my head. But, but, but if I did that, then he would know he was still winning to this day. How many years has it been? How many years since he did that to me? How many years since I've been wanting to fight him since I've been feeling that rock in my goddamn stomach? I, I managed to hide my face from him in the store so that he wouldn't see me as he walked out. And when I saw he was gone, I, I wondered why I still felt that pressure in my chest. I thought that pressure was going to turn my body inside out. I, I reached for my heart, grabbed at my shirt. Maybe the pain was always there, right there by my heart. But I try not to think of it until I go through times like those. I take the final swig of vodka. I feel it burn its way down my throat, hiss at it scorching my tongue, and reach for the bottle to pour myself another. I think of how my tonsils scream every time I let the alcohol rape me. And then I look down at my hands, shaking, holding that glass of poison, and I think of how these were the hands that should have pushed you away from me, but, but didn't. And I keep wondering why I took your hell, took your poison. I remember how you burned your way through me. You corrupted me from the inside out. And I kept coming back. I let you infect me. And now you've burned a hole right through me. I hated it. And now I have to rid myself of you. And my escape is flowing between the ice cubes and the glass nestled in my palm. But I have to drink more. The burning doesn't last as long as you do. It is winter now. The trees have lost their leaves. The city is covered in a thin layer of soot and snow. The grass is dead. In the sunless sky, black birds 
circle overhead, searching for prey. An eerie cold settles over everything. Nothing is growing anymore. Death takes many forms. For you, death first came when you were five years old and your mother had to give you three shots of insulin a day until you could take a needle to yourself. Did it hurt to push that needle into your arm the first time? Or did it hurt you more to know you had no choice? Death takes many forms. Death can be someone telling you without trying that they're losing their sight. Behind Coke bottle classes, you would see me and say, that's a nice black suit you're wearing. And I would tell you, it's green. And you wouldn't believe me. You wouldn't hear the howling wind of the changing seasons. Death takes many forms. I know what follows the autumn wind. It is winter now. Do you remember when it happened? The, the changes are subtle. First the temperature drops, first only slightly. It's almost imperceptible. Only when the first snow falls do you realize where all the seasons have gone. Death takes many forms. Death can be a sweat-soaked shirt, the shakes, dizziness when you needed food. You would look as pale as a ghost as I would hold your cold, wet arm and study you. Quick, so the sugar will make everything better. Isn't everything better yet? Death takes many forms. The signs of death can come when you first lose your circulation. My feet are numb, Janet. You'd say, I can't feel my feet anymore. And I would rub them for you. And you would say it makes a difference. You feel better. If only, if only I could do this forever. Death takes many forms. I said goodbye to you to travel my own road, but I didn't think it was the last goodbye. How was I to know? Are you trying to teach me a lesson? Because if you are, well, I've learned it. Trust me, I have. You can come back now. Death takes many forms, and now, now it seems you've taken me down with you. You've taken me into that casket with you, and I can run my hand along your jacket lapel, and I can feel the coldness of winter all around me, and I can hear them shoveling the dirt over my head, and I want to get out, and I want to take you with me. Death takes many forms. Death can be that hole you left. You know, the one that's right over here, just a little to the left. I keep wondering when the pain will go away, when everything will be better. You once showed me that winter could be beautiful. Instead of the dark and dirty snow lacing the city streets, you showed me a quieting snowfall over a lake in your parents' backyard, glistening in an untouched whiteness. I told you I hated winters. And you told me, this you don't hate. Well, I'm still learning. It is winter now, and death takes many forms. The seasons change for you and I. It is snowing, and something is ending. It is snowing. Somewhere, it is snowing. Dave, 
um, after I dated him for about a year and a half, uh, was the gentleman who died. I was traveling when he died and was unable to go to his funeral. I never saw him lying in the casket. <laughs> Maybe I needed to see him so that I could really say goodbye. Because four months later, on 7-11, I, I almost died in a car accident. Un unconscious for 11 days. <laughs> had severe skull fractures. After losing my car, my home, and my health, all I could do is try to recover. They even called me Elvira Doe in the hospital because they couldn't find any identification tags on me, which of course were lodged in the car, in the purse under my seat in my totaled car. But, while I was in the hospital, I, I kept imagining Dave coming to visit me. He, he came in through another hospital entrance, so no one saw him, and no one knew he was alive, and he was there for me, and I wasn't alone. I felt so alone in the hospital all those weeks. Maybe it was my brain's way of trying to fill in all those unexplained gaps in my life, because, because I used to be king of the universe. I used to have meaning and order and direction in my life. People came to me for ideas and answers and I gave them exactly what they needed. Sometimes I even gave them more. Sometimes they were pleasantly surprised with the knowledge, with the intelligence, with the fact that sometimes pieces fit together so well it almost seemed that they were meant to fit that way. Less often they were disappointed. They, they didn't like my answers. They didn't know why mine were better. They, they held my ability and my triumph against me. They could have been think, unintelligently avoiding, they had been unintelligently avoiding the truth. They could have been thinking like a communist, thinking that someone else shouldn't be revered, but the capitalist in them would think that it should have been them. But it can be done. I used my brain and I proved them wrong. I was invincible. I produced results. And I did it with three times the speed of everyone else. Uh, people were amazed with me. I had a following. And there were many questions I asked. And maybe it's the creative side of me that asks the questions, but the engineer that finds those answers, I, I've always been bold. But, but when you get to the top, when you see the view from the top, well, when you see it all, what more do you have to ask? I don't know God, but I wonder, what would she do in this situation? What would she do? If she found someone like this, so what would she do? My guess is that she would drop it, not kill it, because she's not a vengeful god. But she would punish it unjustly, so that eventually God would then be able to ask them, so now what? You've had all the answers before, so what do you do now? When they get you out of the hospital, everyone will think that you are fine, but you are not. I do that to you. And then you'll have to deal with it all, and you'll have to remain strong, because that is what you do. You'll have to be strong for everyone else, and inside, you'll be falling apart, and no one will understand. Who's your Messiah now? She'll ask. Will you have an answer? But really, though, though, while recovering in that hospital, I even imagine my friend Brian, who now lives in San Francisco, dressing up in old woman's clothing and staying in the room like a patient with me so that I wouldn't be alone. And no, he was never in the hospital. And, and yes, I, I shared my hospital room with an old woman who was a patient that I had never met before. And, and no, no, I never talked to this lady or anything. Uh, while recovering, I even hallucinated that I was in my apartment and not in a hospital bed because I refused to believe that anything was wrong with me. 
I was in pain all the time. Painkillers didn't help. My back was sore. My head always hurt. My sinuses were terrible. I, I wanted the hell out of that hospital, but I couldn't take the first steps to do it. I could barely even stand. They strapped me in my bed at night, and one night, one time, I managed to contort my way out of the harness, wrapped it up, and set it on the nightstand. The nurses thought it was strange that the straps were next to my bed. And when my mother saw how the straps were wrapped, she knew that I had to have done it. I had to fight every step of the way in that hospital. I had three different doctors from different places viewing my records from afar, even nicknamed me Miracle Girl. But learning to walk was no miracle to me. I just had to work harder to prove everyone wrong and try to get my life back. of garments. I do not ask the wounded person how he feels or who he is. I myself become the wounded person. My hurts turn livid upon me as I lay on a cane and observe. Walking, I had to learn how to eat because they kept a tube in me while I was unconscious and after a while it came time for me to eat again. And I thought, I don't need to eat. <laughs> I haven't been eating this entire time in here. Eating is really overrated. What do I need it for? <laughs> so when they told me I could eat, I didn't. They offered breakfast and I told them no. They offered lunch, and I told them no. And by the time dinner came along, my, my stomach was making more noise than I would. I think it's turning a language of its own. So being a vegetarian, I got an egg sandwich, and then it was faced with this task that I didn't know at the time how to undertake. Eating. I, I had to rationalize it to myself. You've eaten before, I told myself. You can do it again. I know it seems foreign to you, but you can do it. Put some food on a fork, put it in your mouth, remove the fork, start chewing, and then just swallow it. You can do this. I had to talk myself through every step. That The first bite was the strangest thing to me. I ate only half the food, but I did it. I know that once I got used to eating, I ate ravenously, but the next morning they offered food again and I got an egg sandwich again and I had to tell myself, you did this yesterday, Janet. I had to goad myself into eating again. Because death is an untrained little bitch. It pees on the carpet and it barks through the night and, it, and it's always begging for scraps at the table. Seeing what it can take from you when you've got your back turned, when you're not looking, and when you want it to heal. Well, it never does. And it never rolls over. And it never plays dead. I know what it takes to die. It's not an emotional, rash decision. It's cold. It's calculated. It's a numbing void. And one day it suddenly all makes sense. And from that moment on, you either look for it, or it looks for you. Death is an untrained little bitch. <laughs> and I've been begging for it, I tell ya, but... It doesn't come when you call. I need a bowl of water out, even, and a bowl of dried dog food, and you know, I never see it eating. But when I check, that bowl is empty. And I still refill the bowl. And vacuum the dog hair that sticks to the couch and spray air freshener in the living room, because no matter how hard you try, you can never get rid of the smell. 
Death is an untrained little bitch, I tell ya. And what it boils down to is this. You won't get along with her, and she won't get along with you. She'll claim her territory under the bed, eating your slipper while you try to sleep, and remind yourself that there are no monsters waiting for you to shut your eyes. My sister started a journal while I was in the hospital uh, for people writing. Uh, my father, who never writes, <laughs> wrote down while I was still unconscious. I squeeze your hand, but you don't squeeze back. But I still love you. And my roommate, a man that I had previously dated and, and loved, he was the first to write in this journal. And he wrote down that he remembered me telling him just before the accident that I had written about a car accident, that he was a fantastic car crash. And he wrote, but it was supposed to be me. And our life is one big road trip now. And we set the cruise control and make our way down the expressway. And most of the time we're just moving in a straight line and the scenery blurs. There's nothing to see. But I know what's inside you and I know what you're made of. There's no such thing as a calm with you. You are a fantastic car crash. You stop traffic in both directions as the gapers gawk and the delay grows and they slow down and stare. Everything shatters with you, you know. It's a spectacular explosion. I try to duck and cover as metal flies through the air. And every time you leave the scene of the accident, I am left picking up the shards of glass from the windows. You know, the glass breaks into such tiny little pieces. They look like ice. It takes so long to pick up the pieces, and even though I'm careful, I'm still picking up the pieces, and I'm still on my knees. And the glass cuts into my hands, and the blood drips down into the street. Think of it as my contribution to this fantastic car crash. That is you, that is me, that is us. As I pull the glass from my hand, and I wave my hand to the line of traffic. Go ahead, keep moving. This happens all the time. There's nothing to see here. Thank you.